Good morning. Is there any place you'd rather be than in worship this morning? Amen. All right, let's get to the important stuff first. Uh, West Delaware. What a victory. Outstanding. You and I. Well, that was pretty quiet. That was pretty quiet. But they're having a great season. They pulled off a couple of great victories before they ran into that buzzsaw. Um, let's go to Iowa. Okay? Yay. Iowa had a good win yesterday. Let's go to Nebraska. You know what? We spotted them, our offense and our defense, and still won the game. We didn't even, we didn't even travel with our offense or our defense. Okay? And I'm saving for the last Iowa State. Holy smokes, where'd these guys come from? Outstanding. <clears throat> okay. Oh, is this the Iowa State theme? See, when I played there, they played it when they scored a touchdown, so I don't know the song. <laughs> Do what now? Oh, okay, there's that. You won't have room in your stand to keep playing like this. Dead go. All right, uh, visitor cards are in the pew. Do you see a picture of them up there? They're in front of you in the pews. If you are a visitor today, we would love for you to um, grab a card and fill it out. And if you go out this door immediately to the left, there's the visitor's desk. And there you will get mug, a uh, coffee mug full of uh, information of the church and some junk food too, because we just want you to know how much we value your visit today. Uh, poinsettia orders are out on the uh, desk out here as well. The deadline for turning these in is November 19th. Because of the hurricanes, there is a shortage this year, so get your orders in as soon as possible. Sherman's is hosting the Trunk or Treat today from 2 to 4. Please bring a non-perishable canned food for payment. You may dress up uh, and always need more cars to participate if you would like to decorate your car this year. Delhi United Methodist Church, uh, the fall dinner is Saturday, November 4th from 4.30 to 7.30. Please take a look at the flyer in the hallway. And now if I can invite Stephanie Stocks to come up. She has an announcement for the vital ministry. Operation Christmas Child. So our church has been participating in Operation Christmas Child for a number <coughs> of years. And we are getting ready to start our seventh year as a drop-off location. And sometimes after you've done something for a long time, you kind of forget, why am I doing this? So I want to show you a quick video um, just to remind you um, the importance of this ministry. Hi, my name is Jania. I grew up in an orphanage. Once a month, we would drive to a public bathhouse where we bathed. And between my age group of 30 kids, we shared one bar of soap. So at age 12, Operation Christmas Child Shoeboxes came to our orphanage. One of my friends, he came rushing to me and said, hey, you, you, we got the boxes. But specifically what was most important to me it had a pot of soap in it and a washcloth. And I specifically remember it was our spring. It was special, but not only that, it was my own. At the age of 14, I was adopted to, uh, to Texas by then, and that's where I learned of the people who pack the shoeboxes and their love to give um, to the kids through a shoebox. And through that, I knew God was real and He was working to bring love and joy to those kids, the kids who needed it. I immediately wanted to get involved with it, and I did. I packed two boxes that, that first year, and, uh, and I wrote a letter. And I just simply said, long ago, I received one of these boxes. Jesus loves you. So I hope that you will do the same. This ministry is not just about the items in the box. Those things are important, um, 
an important tool to open the door to talk to these kids who are receiving the boxes, to let them know that Jesus does love them, to let them know the importance um, of having a relationship with Jesus Christ. Um, it's not just about the box. The children, when they receive their box, also receive a booklet that talks about Jesus' ministry, his gospel, um, his life and death, and his resurrection. After that, the children are invited to participate in a program called The Greatest Journey, which is a discipleship program that takes them through different parts of the Bible and teaches them how to share um, their faith with others. So it's a multi-step process, and the box is just that first step. So there are lots of different ways that you personally can get involved with this ministry. First of all, I ask you to pray. Pray for the children who are receiving this box, but even before that, Pray as to whether this is something you want to participate in. Pray for all the people who are transporting these boxes from the minute they leave our doors at the drop-off location to the minute they get to that child. The truck drivers, um, they go by train, they go by plane, they go by ship. There are so many different ways that they travel. So please pray for all steps in that sense as well. Um, in fact, if you go out to the narthex today, you will find I have a bulletin board up there with pictures of children who have received shoe boxes because the prayer doesn't stop as soon as they get that box. You can continue praying for these children that not only are their eyes open to Jesus, but that they can take that, um, their belief out into the world as well with their family and their friends and their community. So please start praying for this ministry. We are going to have a packing party again this year. It'll be November 11th, and the storeroom downstairs is almost bursting with all the items that we have been collecting so far, so thank you for your donations with that. Um, so on November 11th, starting at 9 o'clock, we will be packing shoe boxes. Our goal is to pack around 600 boxes again, like we did last year, and it's just amazing to see how quickly that gets done. In about an hour and a half to two hours, we will have all those boxes packed. So it's definitely fast-paced, but we definitely need your help with that as well. Um, I'm also looking for volunteers to help at our drop-off location. That is open from November 13th through November 20th. The hours are posted around the building. There's also some small handouts on the Welcome Center if you want to take one of those. But I'm in need of uh, volunteers almost every day. Tuesday and Thursday are covered, but every other day that week, I still am looking for some volunteers to cover that. And along with that, that final Monday, I need some people to help load the truck. Um, if you have a bad back, please don't volunteer. Um, but those boxes, our shipping cartons get very heavy, but we need some help getting those loaded into Bill's truck before he takes those um, shipping cartons to Waterloo for us. Obviously, you can pack a box. I have the red and green go boxes out in the narthex, or you're welcome to provide your own shoe box. A couple of updates this year. No longer can you include any sort of candy. No candy, no food. It's on the do not include list this year, as well as toothpaste. It's really hard to get those things through customs, and we don't want to hold up these boxes. We want them to get them into children's hands. So new this year, no candy, no toothpaste. You can still include toothbrushes and soap and washcloths, things like that. Um, the shipping cost has also gone up. In the past, the suggested donation for shipping was $7. That has gone up to $9 this year. Um, that has not increased in over 10 years, so it was time to um, increase that a little bit. So considering that, if we are planning to pack about 600 boxes at our packing party, that means we need over $5,000 to pay for the shipping of those boxes. We've had one very generous donation already, but we are still going to be looking for ways to raise those funds. So if you would like to make a donation, um, you can make your check out to the church and just put OCC in the memo line. Um, or you can send your um, donation directly to Operation Christmas Child. We are also going to be having a brunch next Sunday after service, which will be a free will donation, so you're welcome to stay and eat with us and make your donation that way. We will also be having a noisy offering on November 19th, which is right towards the end of our collection week. Um, so the children during Children's Sermon will get to help me collect your change to help us with that as well. And... I think that's it. So again, please pray for this ministry and pray for, pray for your involvement and how you might want to get involved. If you have any questions, I will be out in the narthex um, by that display after church. So thank you.
wonderful to be kind of in the center of this amazing ministry with so many amazing stories. And, and I know that we will give that our greatest support this year. And with that, let us set our hearts and minds and let us enter into worship. <clears throat> trust in your wisdom more. Let us think less of ourselves and more of you. Let us not shrink from that which seems beyond us and boldly step out convinced it is not beyond you. Guide our steps to become less so that we may be more. Amen.
The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Lord, it is hard to say goodbye, but to follow where you lead, we must. Goodbye to old ways. Goodbye to old dreams. Goodbye to all those things once thought important. You ask me to blindly go forth, knowing the destination, but not fully the journey. Where you lead, I will follow. I will trust the Lord. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you. As we have received grace and love in Jesus Christ, let us share Christ's peace with one another. Please be seated. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways submit to him and he will make your paths straight. of parts of the service that I like really well, you know, especially pastor's sermon. But, um, <laughs> but this is one of my favorite times. And you know what, you guys, if you would look around, you would probably see a lot of faces that are smiling because I think this is one of their favorite times of the service too. They love to see you. And thank you for coming up. Well, today, I want to talk to you about names. You know, all around the world, people have names. Names are important, aren't they? There hasn't really been a time when a child hasn't been born and they called, they, the parents called them, gave them a name. Well, our names tell us something about us. What does your last name tell about you? You know? Your last name, Rev, Vincent, Aaron. That uh, the family belongs to you. Right, you belong to the Menson family. They used to be called tribes or clans. You belong to the Rev family, don't you, Casey? And that's a big clan. We know lots of Revs. Yeah, we do. Yes. Well, you know. Um, you might be named after someone. Do you know anything about your name? Whether you're named after someone? Your parents took a long time, probably. I know, like, my middle name was my grandpa's name. You guys don't know anything about your name? Parents, let's get with it here. Or maybe they're just shy. I don't know. What about you, Caleb? Do you know anything about your name? Your middle name is after your great grandpa, and what was what's that name? Okay, Robert. Well, um, what I, why I wanted to talk to you about names. You have three names, don't you? First, middle, and last name. 
What if you had over 100 names and your teacher asked you to write that on your paper? Write your full name and you had 100 names. That would be unbelievable, wouldn't it? Well, when God had people write um, the Bible, he wanted to make sure that we knew exactly who he was. So he has lots of names in the Bible. And in scripture, it's gonna talk about, um, well, um, no, I don't wanna go there. What, anyway, can you think of some names that we've given God and Jesus? Can you think of some names, you know? Erin? The Holy Spirit. That's part of the Trinity, isn't it? He's called God, Jesus, and Holy Spirit, yeah? Lord, another name? Okay, pardon me? Messiah, yeah? Scripture's going to talk about the Lamb um, without blemish. Can we call him King? Father, Son. Of course, we know Jesus is the name above all names. But the people who wrote the Bible wanted us to know more. So one of my favorite names for Jesus is rock or stone. Why do you think they gave Jesus a name called rock? What is it about rocks that we like? They never break. They, well, sometimes they break, but they're pretty solid, aren't they? They're strong. So that's really one of the reasons that they gave Jesus that name, rock. If a rock split in two and it was really big, you could hide in it and be safe, couldn't you? And did you know that most houses are built on rock? Stone, cement is part, uh, part rocks. So it's pretty solid. If we put a carrot outside next to a rock and look, came back about three weeks later, would the carrot probably still be there? The rock would be there, wouldn't it? Because it's solid and strong. Well, I want to give you a rock today. Clarissa's helping me. Clarissa, will you open up that brown bag and just hand a rock to everybody? This rock has a name on it. It's the name above all names, Jesus. And it's going to remind you, if you keep it, that Jesus is always there. He's solid and he's strong. But you know, sometimes, that's okay if they don't want to take it. Sometimes, People put rocks in places to remind other people about Jesus. And you could do that with this rock. Have you ever been around town and seen a rock with something written on it or done that yourself? So you can put this at home on your dresser, or you can give it to someone and tell them that they can always depend on Jesus. Let's pray together. Dear Jesus, thank you for being a rock in our lives, solid, dependable. You are strong, and if we have you in our lives, we know that we can go forward and be strong in our faith. We thank you, Jesus, for this day and for this time together. Amen. Thank you, guys. When I left youth ministry and I came to be the, the, the main pastor, the only pastor, whatever they call us, the pastor. And, and, and I, I remember thinking to myself, you know, I'll know my time is, is done when they start handing out rotten fruit in the back of the sanctuary. <laughs> Y'all skipped right ahead to giving the children rocks. <laughs> That's a breach of etiquette. So, Marilyn, you here? Where are you at? Okay, you comfortable? The sermon's going to start now, so I promised Marilyn, she said she was tired this morning. I said well, she could sleep during the sermon, because um, everybody else does. Um, that's my, my plan in retirement, is I'm going to sell tapes of my sermons for sleep aid. Okay? You're my test audience. 
We're going to continue with our series, To Be Holy. Today we're focusing on faith as Peter gives us instruction from 1 Peter um, chapter 1, beginning in verse 13. Let us pray, shall we? Holy and loving God, we thank you so much for this beautiful day you've given us, Lord, in this warm place to rest. And Lord, we come seeking you because we've got so much stuff happening in our lives, so many distractions, so many things in our mind. Lord, just for this time, help us to rest here in you. Help us to be a quiet people listening for your still and quiet voice, O oh God, we pray that you will lead us to be even closer to you. And Lord, as I lead in this time, I, I ask you, please, allow me to diminish, Lord, so that you can be revealed even more. Lord, we love you. Amen. Therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober, set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he who, is, who has called you holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. We are called to set our hope in grace, and this is faith. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. Now faith is the confidence of what we hope for and the assurance of what we do not see. It's that which we can, we, we can experience, but we can't see, much like wind, much like love. We know what it feels like. We understand it when it's happening, but we can't see it. Does that make sense? Okay. We are called in humble obedience through faith to be counterculture. Last week we talked about that we, God has prepared in you a miracle. And, and, and what uh, Peter is telling us now is that we need to live into that miracle, into the world. We are to be counterculture. Our culture through the years has gone in many different directions. Some of us that are more senior in the, in the congregation, we've seen many changes in, in, in a lot of the way that we react with one another. You know, this internet and this cool communication, this is cool stuff, right? But have you, would it surprise you to find out that people are not as kind with each other as they used to be? Because they can sit and they can write anonymously and, and they also, it has statistically been proven that the communication skills of our children have diminished because they're so used to writing anonymously, not in full sentence. Spelling doesn't count. You'd think I'd be more of a fan of that, but I'm not. Culture changes, but God does not. God's truth and reality remains consistent. It's about loving God and loving one another. It is not to be redefined. It is not to be questioned. It is not to be negotiated. It is to be the way we are as Christians. And we trust in this truth through what? Faith. That, that which you cannot see. But we experience and we know to be true. I was trying to think of a great example for this. And of course I came up with what I believe is the greatest of God's miracles. Youth pastors. Okay? Let's talk about being a youth pastor for just a minute. Okay? Because I spent about 20 years there. All right? When you're a youth pastor, you have to fill some roles. First, you've got to be cool to kids, okay? For some reason, kids have to think that you're trustworthy. They have to think that you're someone they can count on. Like, it's kind of fun, okay? And then parents. Well, they're not going to trust their kids to a goofball. So to parents, you have to be responsible. To parents, you have to be someone that, that they can trust their kids with to mentor. Well, those are two difficult rules or roles. And, one, and in the midst of that role, sometimes to be a successful youth pastor, you have to enter into a place and stand between a youth and their parents and, and, and help the parents understand maybe that their behavior needs to be changed. 
That's a lot of fun, right? Youth pastors have this unique role of always being the one who is expected to be the great gamer and have great games for the kids to play and then have some amazing thing to tell these kids so that faith will become immediately real. And, and, and you know, we have these great expectations, but youth pastors are always what? They're the lowest person on any staff. They're always the least paid, right? I mean, it's just the way it is, which is why every youth pastor I know eats a Taco Bell, okay? We are a Taco Bell people, youth pastors, okay? I'm going to tell you a story. If you read a lot of youth pastor guidebooks, you know, written by successful youth pastors, and they always, in the opening paragraph, tell you where they're writing it, they're writing it in Taco Bell, okay? That's just the way it is, okay? Because that's the role of a youth pastor. So what makes youth pastors so unique? Well, I know a bunch of them, and I have my own witness. And one thing that is true about youth pastor, because who goes into that by choice, okay? It's absolutely a calling. Because you know the average tenure of a youth pastor in position is 11 months. Did you know that? They survive 11 months. You know what the average youth pastor is in a career? 14 months. Did you know that? It's a tough gig. Who chooses that? Well, it's people who, in their adolescence, struggled. Now, they all struggle in different things. Some people, they were social struggles. Some people, uh, they were struggles at home. It was struggles with violence. It was struggle with relationships. All kinds of struggles, but for one reason or another, when they navigated their way through adolescence, it was a painful experience for them. And they said, not to another kid. And they stood up and said, this is where I draw the line. No more. There was never, I mean, my kids could go through a lot, but no one was ever going to hurt my kids. Do not lay a finger on them. Not my kids. You know what I mean? We have a passion for that, and that's why we're called into that ministry. Okay? This is what it means to live out your faith in humble obedience. Because the one we seek is holy. The one who seeks you is holy. Because the grace freely given us is holy. Because the giver of the word that teaches us is holy. Because the spirit spirit which guides us is holy. Because we are called to live into this holy image. Holiness is within our grasp. There's a promise there. Holiness is within our grasp. We can live holy. We just have to reach out and take it. We have to accept it. And there can be no holiness without faith. Picking it up in verse 17. Since you call on a father who judges each each person's work impartially, live out your time as foreigners here in reverent fear. For you know that it was not with perishable things, such as silver or gold, that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors. But with precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect, he was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. Through him you believe in God, who raised him from the dead and glorified him. And so your faith and hope are in God. Did you hear that part about reverent fear? You hear about, you know, the fear of God. Reverent fear means what? It means with respect and awe. Well, that sounds like a pretty logical way to go before God. With respect and awe. You were not redeemed with something of such little value as silver and gold. Such little meaning as treasure. No, you're redeemed by the blood of the Lamb without blemish. That was the cost of our grace. Let 
The Lamb who existed in the beginning. Remember John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Word was with God in the beginning. Nothing that is created that has ever been created was created, or all that was created that has ever been created was created through the Word. And what is the Word of God? Jesus. Jesus was a part of the beginning. Jesus was present in the very beginning. Not an afterthought. God's plan to love you was complete in the beginning. And what is God's action? Jesus. Nothing that was created that was ever created was cre- all that was created was ever created was created through the word. Jesus is the loving action of God. And the loving action of God is the unblemished lamb which sacrificed for us on the cross. That is the cost of your grace. Not something so meaningless as jewels or gold or silver. Nothing less than the blood of the Lamb. In faith we know we are in transition from mortality to immortality. And God will be glorified in our resurrection. The gift of God's own righteousness will save us and it will sustain us. Such is the faith of the children of God, and such is our responsibility to be a witness to the world. God self came to us in the form of a helpless babe as an unblemished lamb sacrificed self so that we can know grace, and then resurrection so that we could have faith. Do you understand that? And God's resurrection and all who witnessed it and saw it and said, Dear Lord, it is Jesus. God is here. God is with us. Look at this. And we had faith. And that faith was seated back then, way over there. But through the years, it has traveled all the way to here so that we too can have faith. But it doesn't end there. In our resurrection, in our redemption, in our rebirth, we are witnesses to others, so they too can have faith in the same way that someone lived a resurrected life in front of you so that you would be here. This is our responsibility. And resurrection is faith. All this is our our choice. If our worship is for the Lamb, and not something perishable and meaningless like silver and gold. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 22. Now that you have purified yourselves, let's say that again, see if you catch this. Now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truths that have sincere love for each other, love one another deeply from the heart. For you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but imperishable through the living and the enduring word of God. Did you catch that part? Now that you have purified yourselves. Wait a minute, what? I have a role to play in my own salvation? I thought it was something freely given. What what is it I must do? You must choose. If you want to purify yourself, choose. This is one of those things where you can't ride the fence. You're in or you're out. You're on the bus or you're left behind. You must choose. Do you choose salvation? Do you choose to be imperishable? Or are we locked in perishable? What is the value of your salvation? What is the value of your complete joy? Is it things of this world? Silver and gold that's here today and gone tomorrow. Or is it the blood of the unblemished lamb? Our purity comes from the blood of the lamb. And in verse 23 it tells us we must be born again. John chapter 3, verse 3, Nicodemus, the Pharisee, has come to question Jesus about salvation. 
Jesus told him, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. And Nicodemus says, How can that be possible? How can an adult man be born again? And Jesus said, Because you're thinking about this wrong. Not thinking about your physical, thinking about your spiritual. Be born again. Remember what Ben decide to see last week? Change your perspective. It's not about you. It's about faith. It's about God. It's about all. You are not the star of your very own sitcom. Though I live my life that way a lot. I'm one of God's children. I'm special and unique because God loved me so much that he gave me the choice of salvation through the blood of the lamb. I'm so special. I'm so special just like everyone else is uniquely special. But together, we're just part of the chorus. Part of the chorus that sings praise to God. Danny loves you perfectly right where you are. But he loves everyone around you just as much. We have to come to this understanding. We are loved perfectly, uniquely, amazingly. But so is everyone else. To be holy requires faith. In faith, holiness demands that we love one another deeply with sincerity. Relationships matter. What does this mean? I've used this example before. Until we quit being guilty of it, I'm going to continue to do so. How are you? Well, I'm fine. I, my knee hurts. My gut aches. Got a headache. I'm fine! I don't want to burden you with my stuff. And we're going by. How are you? Fine. How are you? I don't want to, I don't want you to burden me with your stuff. I got my own stuff. My back aches, right? We are so polite here, but we're insincere and we're disingenuous. I want to know, how are you? And if something's up, how can I pray for you, brother? How can I help you, sister? What can I do for you? Not because I want to feel good about myself, but because you are uniquely and amazingly loved by God. He gave his blood for you. And I love God so much that I want to love you like God does. So tell me, how you doing? I stubbed my toe. Let's lay some hands. Leave your shoes on, though. That's nasty. But we don't do that. No, we're strong. We're independent. We're rugged. How are you? Y'all, I'm broken. There are days when I look at my to-do list and I don't have near enough time to get done. And I feel stress. I need prayer. I don't mind telling you that. How many of us fall into that category? <clears throat> This is our lives. And we are living our lives in a unique time, in a unique place, with a unique family. Why can we not be genuine with one another? How are you? Tell me the truth. And if the truth is, I don't feel like bothering you with it. Then tell me that. I'll probably follow up with a question and be annoying just to warn you. But we, to live Insincerity means we truly care about other people. And I want to know what's going on in your world. How do I pray for you? How do I share in your joy or sorrow? How can I participate in your victory or defeat? It's about being genuine with each other, not smiling politely, caring. To love is to be engaged, committed, not because of obligation or gain, but because we know and experience joy and fulfillment 
acceptance and care. These are the, by, these are the byproducts of love. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 4. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. <clears throat> it keeps records of no wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices in truth. It always protects, it always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. God's love, like this, is the consequence of holiness. And holiness requires true faith. To love like this <clears throat> is what we are all called to through faith and holiness for each other. What does this mean? What is all? Does that mean all in my family? Some of them are annoying. Does this mean maybe all in this sanctuary? Nobody here is annoying, I'm sure. Outside of myself, perhaps. All Christians, but some of them truly tick me off. They really do, okay? All whom God has created. Well, you can't mean that because some dress differently than me. Some, some have different bathing requirements, perhaps. Some use different language. Some make choices I don't understand. Some make choices I'm offended by. Some make choices that are just ridiculous. Some hold positions, uh, opinions that are just, you know, unreasonable. Lord, what does all mean? Give me the parameters and I'll buy in, won't we? I'm going to like all who look like me, think like me, dress like me, and enjoy the stuff I enjoy. That's an easy one. Let's I'm into that all. How about you? Did you hear the words? All means all. Everybody. But, 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 shut up. Phil, you're whining too much. All's everybody. Love them all. But Lord, they don't love my football team. All means all. And I love your football team. Did you catch that part? Scripture says God's a Husker fan. <laughs> See, that's one of those opinions you're going to have to love me through right there. I'm just saying that, okay? <clears throat> when we try to define all, those are the standards we set for ourselves. But these are not God's standards. If our faith is true, if it is truly holiness we seek, we are created to become something new, born again by the Spirit, to love all, to see all, to accept all. Y'all, that doesn't mean we accept everything somebody does, okay? I can love you and walk with you because gambling's hurting your family. I can love you and walk with you because alcohol is hurting your family. To love someone does not mean that we have to love every choice they make. It is to love the image of God created in them at the time of the beginning. That's what it means. And to care enough genuinely to walk with them so that they too can find their way into holiness. That's what it's about. Yes, to love each other is to love all, everyone. Now Peter quotes to us from Isaiah chapter 40, beginning in verse 24. All people are like grass, and all their glory is like flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word that was preached to you. People are like grass, we are mortal. We're here for a season and then we wither and die. And you know, whatever accomplishments, no matter how grand or perhaps insignificant in our own eyes, they will be here for a season and then they are gone. But God's word endures forever beyond any season, time, or place. O oh, mortals, do you not understand that which has been offered to you is immortal? It's a choice. You just need to reach out and take it. Here. This is for you. Here. 
There are consequences for immortality. Holiness, you're going to love everybody. You're going to accept all. You're going to know joy in every circumstance because you know that it doesn't last forever. It's but a season, and you are now immortal. Here, do you want it? Is this the choice you'll make? How many of us hesitate or begin to negotiate? I'm all about this part. It's this part we need to talk about. Right? Because some people are annoying. Over and over again, Peter reiterates to us that what we were purchased by was insignificant. The perishable, the silver, the gold, the treasures of this world. And that wasn't enough for one as special as you or me. No, we needed the blood of the lamb without blemish. Something imperishable to buy something imperishable. Immortality. First Peter chapter 2, beginning verse 1. Therefore, rid yourselves of all malice and deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander of every kind. Like newborn babies crave pure and spiritual milk, so that by it you may grow up in your salvation, now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. Paraphrase, therefore rid yourself of the negative things of the human condition, hate, anger, lies, hypocrisy, jealousy, gossip, gossip. How many of us are sitting here going, oh, geez, that was Friday, okay? Guilty of most of those Friday. Picked up the rest on Saturday. I'm an overachiever, okay? This is kind of the human condition that we live in and we embrace. It's not my fault, Lord. Everybody else does this. This is what our culture does. This is what, you know, this, what, this is who we are. Take us as we are, Lord. The Lord says, you know, I love you right where you are but you're meant for more. You're meant for better relationships. You're meant for greater joy. You're meant for perfect peace. Let go of this human condition. Because the human condition is not holy. Did you hear the words? You are meant for something more, mortals. Immortality. You're to crave spiritual milk. These are the things of holiness, things that support and help us to grow in our faith. Edifying relationships, relationships that glorify God. Prayer, Bible study, on your own. Because people, the world has so much louder voice than I do. I get 20 minutes on a Sunday The world gets all the rest of the time. I don't know about you. See, I'm weak. I am frail and I am weak. I cannot survive day to day without God's word. I open the Bible and I read. Well, pastor, you have to. You got to get this stuff done. No. I read the Bible three different ways. I read the Bible in preparation of the sermon every week. And I spend hours trying to fill my brain with something relevant to share with you. And then I open my Bible and I read it because I'm going to teach the kids a little later this morning. We're learning about Romans. Ask them about it. So I get ready for that. And then there's the me time. When I open the Bible just to see what God's going to say to me. And you know what? A lot of the time, when you see me excited up here, and I'm passionate, and I love to share something cool with you that I learned, do you know where most of these series has come from? The Bible study I did a couple months ago on my own that I found fulfilling and amazing, and I couldn't wait to share it with you. That's the way it works. See, if I didn't have that, the world would get my attention. See, I'm not as strong as you. Sometimes I can get angry about politics. I'm sure you're all stronger than that. 
sometimes I can start to think less of a group of people because they don't share my ideas. See, I'm weak, not like you. I need the word. Bible study helps us to grow closer to God. It helps us to understand God more and to see God's face clearer. Relationships with lots of different people help us to come into contact with the image of God because no one of us can contain all the image of God. So there's pieces and parts in all of us that when we come together and we share our faith, God becomes greater, deeper, and clearer in our vision. That's a choice. We can do that. Or is this the part we're negotiating on? I like this salvation thing, Lord. This is cool stuff. But this Bible study thing, the world's got so much to offer. And the Lord looks upon you and says, but it's perishable. And you are meant for imperishable. How are we to be like newborn babies? We are to hunger for God's word. Have you tasted that the Lord is good? How shall you share the Lord's flavor with all whom you meet? You know, we have a choice. We can be in the world, or we can be in the Lord. And this choice looks something like this. And I mean this, we're like junkies, okay? You know, we, we come out of church and by Tuesday, you know, we, we need our fix. I, 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 come on, I, just, give me some gossip. Just give me a little gossip. I need my fix. I'm jonesing for some jealousy, people. <laughs> Feed me. Feed my human condition. We're meant for more. You don't labor for it. It's a choice. Do you choose imperishable? Do you honor the imperishable which purchased you? Amen.
You may be seated. Now we come to my favorite part of service. We get to share the joys and concerns we have as a congregation. What joys do we have or concerns? Yes, sir. I'm going to have to come down there, Burl. Hang on a moment. And his name again was Glenn Hakeman. Okay, Glenn Hakeman has a difficult diagnosis with cancer. He's in critical condition, and they've sent him home. Okay, let us keep Glenn in prayer. Yes, sir. It's whose birthday? It's Nana's birthday today. Outstanding. Do you want to tell us what number? She won't mind. <laughs> Others? Yes? Dan McDowell. Oh, he fell at work and broke his shoulder. Okay, Dan McDowell. All right, let's keep him in prayer. Okay, others? Yes, sir. I'm glad that you brought Mr. Lux up because I'm going to ask Bill to come forward if he doesn't mind. Y'all, I have heard uh, recently that Bill got a difficult diagnosis, and so I'm going to ask all who wish to come forward and let's lay hands and let's do a little prayer time right here and right now. What do you say? Loving God, we thank you for this chorus of saints that are here that are praying right now. Lord, hear our prayer and our voices. Lord, we thank you for Bill and all that he has taught us. For me personally, Lord, a mentor in faith. Lord, we ask you please just to be with Bill as he goes through some difficult decisions, concerns with his health, Lord. Your will be done. Lord, we know that your love for Bill is complete and amazing. But Lord, don't forget, we love him too. Lord, we ask you please just to be with Bill through this difficult time. Be ever present and be near. Lord, we ask you please just help us to learn to love you as Bill loves you. Lord, let our witnesses be like Bill's. Lord, we just love you. And we ask you please to be with Bill. Put your hands upon him and hold him so near. And be with his family and those who care for him. Lord, we love you. And we put our full trust and faith in you. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Good job. Have you done, sir? I feel better than 90% of the 90-year-olds in here. <laughs> <laughs> Chapman. He had bypass surgery at St. Luke's on Thursday, and he's he's having a lot of complications. Okay, Laverne Chapman had bypass surgery at St. Luke's. Brother, brother-in-law, brother-in-law and would like to lift him in prayer. Okay, <coughs> yes, ma'am. Yay! I have a name for you too. So yay! So the Care and Concern Committee are getting out and getting ready to get busy, and that is outstanding, okay? Others? Y'all, don't you just love a praying church? You know, the other day, we got done with the sermon. I looked up, it was 1039. And I said, man, we are out of here on time. I mean, there's no way I can mess this up from here. (laughs) Prayer time ended at 1007. And I said, Lord, thank you for a praying church. Isn't it amazing? Let us pray, shall we? Holy and loving God, we thank you for this time you've given us to be together. And Lord, these these people, this this tribe known as Manchester United Methodist Church, thank you. Thank you that we 
with genuineness, share our joys, our concerns, our victories, our defeats. Lord, our laughter and our tears. We ask you to enter into all that we have mentioned and Lord, those that we have kept silent about. And Lord, for all the victories that we've talked about and those defeats that we still hold near. Lord, lay your hands upon us, upon these people, Lord, and reach beyond these walls to all whom we love and care about. Lord, reach beyond these walls to all whom we seek to join us, to be a part of this amazing family. Lord, be revealed in us and be with those we care about. Amen. Now if we can have the ushers come forward, we'll return to God a portion of the abundance we've received. Lord, we thank you that your love for us is so great that it includes trust. Lord, we are amazed that you trust us so much as to be a part of your ministry in this world, in this unique time, from this unique place. Lord, we pray that you will take these gifts that we have given you and, and, and Lord, just let them grow. Lord, let them grow. Let your voice be heard. Let it be proclaimed in all the place in the world where hopelessness is known, where suffering, where, where there's poverty, Lord. Lord, just where there's brokenness and lack of personal value, Lord, let your voice be proclaimed. And Lord, our prayer is that it will be proclaimed in such a way that they can hear it. And Lord, we pray that it will be proclaimed through us. Let us be your people, your loudspeakers in this time. Lord, this we pray as you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our
What an amazing morning of worship. How blessed am I to have shared it with all of you this morning. I would like to remind you that there is a study group that meets in the conference room uh, at, well, 10.30ish. We're going to say 10.45 this morning, Bill? Okay. That Bill and Dave lead that um, is questions that I put together from putting the information together for the sermon. And so if you'd like to go a little deeper and hear a little bit more about what we were talking about this morning, please go to the conference room about 10.45. And, and, and you know, I have this vision. I have this vision that that conference room one day is so full, we got to move it in here. That would make me so very happy to know that we are really committed to getting all we can out of God's word. With that said, let us pray. Holy and loving God, we thank you so much for this time and place and Lord, these people. And Lord, we thank you most of all for your presence here. For without your presence, we are nothing and our worship is meaningless. Lord, let us have hearts that are worthy and worship with meaning. Lord, let us reach out and lay possession to that which you offer us. Lord, help us to be imperishable. And Lord, we pray for more than that. We pray that you will create in us to be vessels of your spirit so that others will experience you loving them through us. And Lord, let them say there is something special about Jesus. Oh, Lord, let them wish to know you more. This is our prayer. We love you. Amen. Amen. 